Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters, wherever you may find yourselves on this Lord's Day. What a blessing it is to be able to worship together in this way. And if you are watching this before 11 a.m. on Sunday, I would invite you to join us for our second Zoom fellowship hour this morning. You can find the login in your church email. Today's service is also particularly special for me as we will get to share with you my son Nathan's baptism. Eric and I are disappointed that the pandemic prevented us from celebrating this joyous occasion with you in person, but we are very happy that we can bring you into the sacrament uh, in this virtual way. And we are so grateful for the promises that we know that you are making on Nathan's behalf wherever you are this morning. And so now let us join together in worshiping God as we join in our responsive call to worship. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. A family formed by faith, we gather to worship the living Lord. The Lord says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. A family formed by faith, we gather to kneel before the giver of mercy. No matter who we are, the Lord gathers us in and calls us God's own. Let us praise God. How good and pleasant it is when we live in communion with God and in community with others. But we know so often that we have broken out of that communion and community. We know that what has become familiar is what is unintended. So as we come to this time of worship, let us confess those breaks in our relationship with God and others. Let us join in our unison prayer of confession that will be followed by a time for silent prayers. Let us pray. Holy One, there is much we must confess. When we discount another's pain or overlook neighbors in distress, forgive us. When we choose callous words over compassionate impulses, forgive us. When we think others less deserving of grace than we are and ration kindness as if it could be exhausted, 
forgive us. Have mercy upon us, Lord, and heal our brokenness, so that every word and deed that proceeds from our hearts might glorify you. Amen. Please join with me in our responsive assurance of pardon. Friends, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Receive the gift of forgiveness and share that gift with others in the name of Jesus Christ. We rejoice in God's mercy for us. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Last week, I told you a story about Peter and how he lost his focus on Jesus when he was walking on the water and he started to sink. He needed Jesus to help him. This week, I'm gonna tell you a story about a woman who needs, needs Jesus' help. Her daughter is very sick and she can't seem to get well. The woman knows that Jesus can heal her. The problem is Jesus doesn't know her and she has nothing to offer him. All she knows is that her daughter is weak and Jesus is strong. The Bible tells us that Peter called out to Jesus and said, Lord, save me, when he started to sing. And Jesus did. Jesus put out his hand and he saved him. But at the end, Jesus said to Peter, you have no faith. In this story, the woman kneels down before Jesus and she says, Lord, help me. Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. And her daughter was healed instantly. Jesus knew that this woman was desperate and brave enough to push through the crowd of disciples to get to him to ask for help. She had a strong faith that Jesus would heal her daughter, and he did. Let us pray. Dear Lord, help us to always keep our faith in you strong. Help us to know that healing begins when we reach out and ask for help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And let us pray. Creator God, we give thanks for this beautiful day, this beautiful morning. But we give thanks for this beautiful opportunity to witness and participate in a time that is so very special a time where we recognize the child of the covenant and know that he is with you now and for eternity. And we pray that as we share this time together on this day, that we will know your presence and your moving and all that is said and done. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. On behalf of the session, I present Nathan Alexander Sarver, son of Eric Sarver and Sarah Green, for the sacrament of baptism. <laughs> I have some questions for you two. Do you desire that your child be baptized? We do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to uphold the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your child? We do. Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Nathan by word and deed with love and prayer, encouraging him to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of his church. If so, say, we do. We, we do. do. What is your child's name? Nathan Alexander Sarver. Nathan Alexander Sarver. I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And may you know that you are a child of the covenant, sealed in God's grace, and marked for eternity. Amen. And we welcome Nathan into the covenant community. And as we've just said, he is a part of that community now and for all of eternity. And let us now share a closing prayer. 
Eternal God, we do give thanks for this day, this day that you have made, a very special day when we welcome one into your covenant community, a day when we know that Nathan has been marked and sealed as yours. We pray for him now that you will continue to be with him. We pray for Sarah and we pray for Eric that you would be with them as well as they continue to grow as a family. And we ask that together we can serve you and we can share your peace. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Please join with me in our unison prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Lord, by the power of your Spirit, give us your words of life that our faith may increase and our hearts be made whole. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 28. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard of this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled by, up by the roots. Leave them, they are blind guides. If the blind led the blind, both would fall into a pit. Peter said, Explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes to, into the stomach and then out the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immortality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The Lord came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord. She said, Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sometimes the Bible gives us straightforward stories, beautiful images, inspiring words, and an easily digestible message. And sometimes it gives us something much messier and more uncomfortable, much like real life. Today's passage from Matthew falls in that latter category. Today's is a text to grapple with that leaves as many questions as it provides answers. We're also right in the middle of Dave's final sermon series on faith, hope, and love, these essentials that bind us together as Christians. Yet today, we get a text that swirls with things that divide. Purity versus defilement, bias and prejudice, harsh language and uncertain power dynamics. This too is like real life. Struggle, challenge, and division plop themselves right in the middle of our faith, hope, and love, right in the middle of our happy times and our most meaningful connections. Real life is a pretty constant mess of the good, the bad, the sweet, and the ugly. And we just have to do our best to hold it all at the same time and make what meaning we can of it. I came into an image this week that captures so much of what life is like right now and what this passage is like for me when I read it. A friend of a friend 
who is an astrology enthusiast, said that whatever alignment is happening with the planets and moons has produced a cosmic energy that is like metal on metal. Now, astrology aside, isn't that kind of a perfect image, a perfect sound for 2020? Metal on metal. And when Jesus says to this Canaanite woman, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, that's pretty metal on metal for my faith. The Jesus I know may speak hard truths, challenge institutions, make people uncomfortable with the life-altering depth of his teachings, but he doesn't sling sexist racial slurs like calling someone a dog. The Jesus I know shows immediate compassion to thousands of people crying out for his help and mercy, just as this woman does. He digs deep into his reserves even when he's tired and his silent retreats get interrupted by clamoring crowds. He doesn't ignore the pleas of a desperate mother and keep on walking. Yet here in this story, Jesus initially does just that. No explanations or particularly illuminating context to help us understand metal on metal. The Canaanites and Israelites had been enemies for centuries. When Israel entered the Promised Land, they displaced the Canaanites. And the Hebrew Bible tells countless stories of the Israelites slaughtering the Canaanites at God's command. By Jesus' day, though, Canaanites no longer technically existed as a tribe. So it's not totally clear who this woman is, besides someone distinctly other to the Jewish prophet and his disciples. As a woman and a mother to a demon-possessed daughter, she would also have been deemed unclean and lesser than these men. Therefore, the disciples want nothing to do with her. They urge Jesus to send away this shrill, pushy, foreign, pagan woman. Some commentators suggest that Jesus then simply voices the bias and prejudice of those around him, even though he doesn't agree with them. He uses this encounter as an illustration of his teaching just previous on the defiling power of words. He holds up a mirror for them to see the ugliness contained in their hearts and their behavior, all the while intending to heal the woman's daughter. This is a more comfortable interpretation of Jesus' response, but I'm not completely sure that the text clearly bears it out. Other commentators have suggested that Jesus learns and genuinely changes because of his encounter with this Canaanite woman. When she talks back to him and turns his own words around on him, she calls Jesus on the carpet for his own limited views, both of her and of the scope of his entire ministry. The idea that Jesus bore our human tendency for making mistakes and shared our human need to learn and grow in his views, certainly makes him incredibly relatable. And there is some comfort in that connection, perhaps especially for those of us who may find ourselves struggling with our own bias, our own power, our own privilege, our own hidden thoughts. But not everyone is okay with a son of God who needs to change in this way. Theologian Joy Moore says that as a woman of color, it's hard for her to read Jesus in this passage as a screw up. And to be an ethnocentric sexist is rather a screw up because it's hard to 
quote, get to the lordship of someone that needs me to tell him that I'm created in the image of the God he claims to be the son of. So this interpretation too is sticky and messy. Instead of trying to smooth away the shock of Jesus's response, I think we just have to sit with this story for what it is. A jumble of racial difference, prejudice, long-seated resentments, and an ultimate messy inbreaking of mercy and grace. Interestingly, chillingly really, this lectionary passage has coincided with events of significant racial unrest in our own country for at least the last three cycles. This year, we read about the Canaanite woman being rebuffed and slandered in the wake of the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, and the nationwide protests over systemic racism and its specific manifestation in police brutality. Three years ago, in 2017, this passage came up just after the white supremacist rallies in Charlottesville. And three years before that, in 2014, Michael Brown had just been shot and Ferguson was ablaze with protest and rioting. From these particular pages of scripture, Jesus speaks to us of the defiling power of the heart spilled forth in word and action. We see the division between Jew and Gentile, a wall thick enough that it leads Jesus to act in uncharacteristic fashion by first ignoring a desperate mother's plea for help and then voicing the commonly held prejudice of his people. And we, when we look up from the pages of scripture, we see the power of the defiled heart of our nation spilled forth in word and action, in racial slurs and lives unjustly cut short. We see the division between white and black, a wall in our society that is over 400 years thick and that permeates all of us in ways we are just beginning to acknowledge and recognize. This text and its parallel within our current events challenges us to consider our own internal commitments and how those manifest themselves through our words and actions. The messiness of both text and world hold a mirror to the messiness of our own beings. Our biases and prejudices, our conscious and unconscious ideologies all jumbled up with the ways that we are good people. And this messiness calls us to the hard work of self-examination and self-reflection. Fortunately, just as the Canaanite woman's story brings us to these challenges, she also gives us the gift of a way through, persistence and faith. The woman persisted in the face of Jesus's silence, in the face of the disciples urging him to send her away, and in the face of Jesus likening her to a dog. She did not give up because she loved her daughter so fiercely and because she believed, even as an outsider to the house of Israel, that the God of Israel's mercy cannot be contained, and that the grace of God's kingdom is in fact so powerful that even a mere crumb would be enough to rid her daughter of this demon. And ultimately, Jesus does recognize her persistence as faith and extends the grace to heal her daughter instantly. The bright light of hope emerges from this jarring narrative. So as we continue to face down the challenges of 2020, may we remember what a powerful pair persistence and faith can be in the midst of life's messiness. 
when the world and our lives feel like metal on metal, when racial prejudice and division and general societal ugliness reach their overwhelming peak, may we persist in the faith and hope that the kingdom cannot be contained by the walls we set up, the biases we harbor, or the silence we keep, and that even the crumbs of that kingdom contain a mercy and grace more powerful and transformative than we can ever imagine. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, we give thanks for the communion we share with you that binds us with eternal bonds that sustain us hour by hour and day by day. May we live with the reality of your grace that is sufficient and your love that is unconditional. May the eyes of our hearts, minds, and souls be adjusted and attuned to your presence and the powerful light of Christ, even in the midst of the messiness of life. We give thanks that the communion we experience is for all, expressed as a community that knows no bounds or exclusion. Enfolded in the grace and unconditional love intended for all, may we be committed to be a community that matters, that matters in its intentionality to love in a way that is sacrificial. Sacrificing our personal images and understandings to welcome all where the empowering of the Spirit matters to allow us to be for others in ways we cannot do in our own strength, where it matters that we will be known for our love. This morning, we lift up those who face specific challenges. We think of those struggling with employment and housing insecurity the ongoing isolation some have needed to bear, those who struggle with disease and dis-ease within their lives. And we know there are so many who are challenged at this time, so many that feel they continue to struggle for just a little bit. And we pray that we will have a sensitivity and a persistence in our faith to reach out and welcome all into our community. We pray for those within the Presbyterian Church in Morristown who need our prayers and care. We lift up Hal and Carolyn. We pray for Chris. And we pray for Gail as she faces surgery. We pray this day for Nathan and we give thanks for the baptism that we could share in and celebrate. We also pray that you will be with Sarah and Eric. And we know that there are many others we have on our hearts and minds on this day. So in this silence, we share these names. May we seek ever new understandings and expressions of the communion we share with you and the community that declares this union. We now join together in the prayer you taught us to pray that we share with others that have come before us and those around the world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
now to persist in faith through the messiness, the challenge, the hope, the healing, and know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit go with you and fill you with hope this day and forevermore. Amen.